Um, so then we are now moving to our second panel discussion on social imaginaries. Um, also very excited for this one. We have uh, Olivier moderating and uh, again, three panelists, uh, which are Astrid, Johannes and Jeroen. I think I will just let uh, Olivier introduce uh, everyone. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for still being here. And also thanks yeah, again to the organizer, to, to Rose, and for, for kicking up this event. And the others, and also Sarah, for, for putting this together. It's been a great event so far. And, uh, yeah, so I said we will now have the, the second uh, panel discussion on social imaginaries, and it will focus more on the re relationship between imaginaries and the actual world, basically. The, uh, the reality and look at what different imaginaries and ways of conceiving these imaginaries do in the actual world. So how do they constrain our action or how do they, do they open up to new possibilities? And this somehow also resonates quite well with, with the talk we had today by just now, <laughs> in case I think we see here the, the different dimensions. So, so let me first introduce the, the three panelists. Have can today. I just quickly, Olivier? Can I just quickly interrupt to say that yeah. your sound quality isn't very good? It's Sorry, yeah, I just noticed at this moment that my mic was up. Did you hear me? Or now it's better. It's better yeah. now, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Apologies. Yeah. C could you hear? Well, I I won't start the the introduction. No, we could hear you. It was just a little hard okay. to hear. So yeah, yeah, let me go to the three uh, panelists today. So we have uh, Johannes Kleska. I'm also meeting them for the first time, by the way. Uh, so Johann Johannes has a master's in futures research from the Freie Universität in Berlin. He's a partner at Third Wave, a foresight and technology studio, which he held, which he co-founded, basically. And uh, his motivation is to increase increase people's capacity for self-determination in an increasingly complex world. And Johannes is especially interested in theoretical work combining critical future studies with the social science literature on imaginaries. And basically, his theoretical elaborations also inform uh, well his his work, uh, and it helps to identify and understand the, the preconceived notions, for instance, people bring with when they enter such. Uh, discussion processes about uh, futuring. And we also have as a second speaker, Astrid Magnus. Uh, Astrid is a PhD researcher at the Urban Future Studio at uh, Utrecht University. Astrid's research is basically on the use of various futuring methods from backcasting to gaming to imagine and realize transformation to sustainability in urban areas in Europe and in Japan. And uh, in her research, she experienced with different groups uh, of governance actors and also novel methodologies, uh, such as gaming, visioning, backcasting, to see if new images of the future basically also lead to, to new uh, imaginaries and new actual practices uh, for transformation to sustainability. And our third speaker, uh, Geraldine Woman, is a, is a postdoctoral researcher also uh, at the Urban Future Studio in Utrecht. And uh, Jaron's work focuses on the social, cultural, and scientific practices that create society's conceptions of the future. So he has worked on climate engineering and explored how and why climate engineering became basically a potential approach to address anthropo anthropogenic uh, climate change. And he questions how social processes allow us to imagine the future in particular ways, and also how uh, imagined futures become lived and enacted and how they basically influence actual practices. So that's basically, you see their profiles uh, the, um, resonate quite well with the topics we want to explore. Maybe also a few words about myself, where uh, I come from and uh, in which perspective I moderate this. So I'm a research associate uh, at the International Political Economy and Energy Policy Group at the University of Basel. I was for a long time a researcher uh, at the Transdisciplinarity Lab at ETH Zurich. Um, I'm a geographer by training, and I'm interested in how does the subsurface now, basically the underground, is being reimagined as a site of decarbonization for energy production, and well, well before it was really the site of extractions. Um, can I share my screen, Sarah? Should it be possible, or 
Yeah, uh, on the lower yes. bar. Just to show the, the three questions um, I have sent uh, to the panelists, the three questions we will go through today. So the first question is, what stuff are the imaginaries you encounter in your work made of? What is the relationship between imaginaries and the topics you work with? What functions do the imaginaries you encounter in your practice have in the present? So that's basically the three questions we will go through. Um, We'll first uh, hear the, the, the panelists one by one on each question. Um, if you have like pressing uh, understanding questions, do not hesitate to intervene, but we'll rather uh, open up the discussion when the panelists have gone through the, the three questions. So uh, let me now whoop, just go through the, the, the first question. So I will start with, um, Johannes, and uh, maybe Johannes, you can uh, tell us like, uh, well, basically what the what stuff are the imaginaries you encounter in your work made of, maybe define also how you, you understand these imaginaries and also how uh, does this affect the way you, you approach them in your work? Yeah, for sure. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much uh, also for inviting me um, for the opportunity and uh, two, two things uh, up front. If I repeat something that has been said in other panels before, I'm sorry. Uh, it's very busy days these days, so I couldn't e extend the other panel, for example, yesterday. And the other thing is, um, the, just want to put out there: I I don't have an, uh, like a strong academic background. I've worked in in foresight uh, the last ten years uh, with my studio, um, and just gone back to university in 2017 to do the master in futures uh, studies. So um, I have a very hands-on approach to social theory, um, which uh, gives me a different perspective on it, but maybe could add something to the discourse. Um, so um, as I said, so I, I've, I've done a lot of foresight work with clients, especially um, from, from companies and organizations. Um, and, I, and for me, it was always uh, interesting to observe that when we would do like a scenario workshop on digital transformation, clients would come in with a very preconceived notion of what was that about? Like, so, oh, we're going to do something about AI, right? I mean, it's digital transformation. Future of digital, digital is AI, right? So what kind of AI service are we going to do? It's like, wait a minute, there is more out there. Why do you think it's, it has to be AI. Oh, um, and this led me then when, um, and then on the other hand, in, in this, during uh, the master's uh, program, I became really interested in critical future studies, like questioning existing images of the future and where they come from and the values underneath them. And uh, I stumbled upon a paper um, from two um, media researchers um, called Beyond Capitalist Realism, which in 2017, try to like reinvigorate critical future studies. Um, and they used uh, the term future imaginaries as something that to in be investigated by, um, by critical fu uh, futures researchers. And I was like, wait a minute, future imaginaries, this sounds exactly what I was experiencing with my clients. Um, so I looked up the term, um, and, uh, and, and, and then decided to investigate it in my master uh, thesis. So I wrote my master thesis about future imaginaries. And my, my, my goal was at the beginning to find methods to make them more visible, more tangible, to work with them. But my supervisor said, the problem here is that there is a tendency in, in future studies to go straight to the method because you can sell that really well. Uh, you just create another canvas, um, and then you uh, and, and and you write your book, um, and then you can become a, a famous uh, a futures researcher and sell a lot lot of uh, access to canvas stuff like that. Most kind of joking, but not really. Um, so he said the problem is that we will usually lack theory, and future imaginaries is a term that gets thrown around, but nobody really has put some theory behind it. And so this is what I did in my master's thesis. I tried to create a theoretical approach to the term future imaginaries by combining the understanding of images of the futures from critical futures studies 
and social imaginaries from social theory and then bringing that together and see what happens. And just to quickly define what I understand with future imaginaries. So the social imaginaries part is we're talking about expectations in a group or collective, even a society that have become so much accepted that, they're not, that, they're, that they are not questioned anymore. They're just taken for granted. And then if we combine it with the future, it means that, that, that there are expectations about a time in the future that are held by a group or a collective right now. Um, so this is a, just like a, a, a quick, like proper definition. The really fun thing with definitions about imaginaries as I learned this, that um, my, my supervisor always used to say, but I don't really understand what are imaginaries. And then at the end of my master thesis, I stumbled upon a new journal uh, from Austria, like a special uh, issue about social imaginaries. And in the editorial, they wrote, since Benedict Anderson, we uh, people have tried to come up with an official definition of social imaginaries and have failed at, uh, since to, since today, so uh, so I was like, oh, I'm 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 good. Uh, nobody really has done it yet, um, and it's, I think even it's part of uh, find it kind of interesting that it's um, that it is not really hard to define it, which is also what imaginaries are. They're really hard to grasp and especially if identify. So to make that long story short, um, for me, future imaginaries are constantly happening in my work. It's what it's the preconceived notions, the things that my clients take for granted about the future that they are not even interested in discussing because they just, they just uh, think this is obvious. How could everybody, anybody think something else about this? Uh, this is gonna happen. This is for certain. And my role always is to like loosen it up a bit, like bring it more to the foreground um, and question it. And by this, like, again, opening the space uh, that, that is there for um, to imagine, actually. Thanks, Johannes. And I pass the word uh, to Astrid. Maybe Astrid, you can tell us, like bring us maybe a different view than the very interesting view from practice here. Yeah, I think, thanks, uh, Olivier, and hi, everyone. Um, I think I may be a little bit in between Johannes and Jeroen in terms of being very practically minded and very theoretically skilled. Um, because as you said, Olivier, uh, in my research, I engage with different groups of actors and I experiment with them with different futures methodologies, like from scenarios, which is more traditional perhaps, uh, to more creative practices like games. Um, and um, I consider imaginaries to be kind of this big driving force in any type of transformational project process. Um, and what I see in my case studies usually um, is that there is one dominant imaginary. So when we're talking about the stuff that imaginaries are made of, for me with these groups of people, it's, it's a different thing every time. So it can be from uh, food system imaginaries to smart city imaginaries. Um, so the content is a bit different every time, but what I see is that there's usually a dominant imaginary, for example, what the food systems should look like or what the um, market should look like. Um, and then what we usually work with is this group of people who all have their own ideas about how these systems uh, could be better. So, uh, and then with these futures methodologies, we try to bring them together and sort of put all these new ideas together into a new shared uh, image. So a new imaginary perhaps, um, because that's also a bit how I see uh, imaginaries is that um, it's this collectively shared image of the future that guides decisions in the present and therefore also guides what the present looks like. And to me, um, and this is maybe perhaps a little bit different from Johannes' uh, definition, is this practical component in the present is very important to me. So I usually kind of also follow Sheila Jasanov's definition, uh, which she uses for social technical imaginaries, but I think without the social technical um, aspect at the end, it's still a really beautiful definition for any kind of imaginaries. And I especially gravitate toward the 
beginning of her definition, which states that it's these collectively held, institutionally stabilized and publicly performed visions of desirable futures. Um, and I think these three things, um, this collectivity, the performance and this institutionalization are um, really what is the link between just speculating about futures and them really manifesting in a present. So for me, that makes it a really powerful concept. Thanks a lot, Astrid. Yeah, so you already pointed to potential like uh, differences with Johan's. Uh, Johan's, um, do I pronounce your name correctly, by the way? Uh, definitions or working definitions. I'm interested also to hearing these. Johan, it's your turn. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think Astrid just was spot on by spotting her own uh, intermediacy between me and Johannes. Um, I think because my work is is mostly around really that question, what is the imaginary, but also and what I'm specifically interested in is where does it come from? How does it change? And I think I think one of the things that is really important for me when we talk about imaginaries that that hasn't been brought up yet is the normative aspect. And it, it's much more than an image or an expectation. It's, and I, I think this is when we talk about imaginaries, uh, I think Johannes makes a very good point that no one has been able to uh, definitively define what the imaginary is. But a lot of people are circling uh, something that might be the right definition and no one will ever be able to strictly define it. But when Charles Taylor says that imaginaries are people the way that people imagine their social existence and how they fit together with others. And specifically, and I think this is important, uh, the deeper normative notions that underlie these expectations. It, it's really about that when we talk about imaginaries, it's not just about the future we want, it's also about the social structures that we imagine there to be. So where I think about the the, the stuff that imaginaries are made of. It, it's really about the, how we re-embed those normative notions through all the things that we do uh, all the time. And I think for me, this is one of the most fundamental papers on this as, is a very old paper on, on gender by Judith Butler on gender as a performative act, where it, it's, it's a role-playing thing that we do to really re-embed all of these notions that we have about gender, but also, of course, about the imagined future. So I think we need to be very careful when we talk about imaginaries to, to tease apart when is it an image or a vision, and when is it really that imaginary? When is that institutional st stabilization there? But not just the institutional, right? It, it's really that, that personal kind of way of dealing with uh, the things that we imagine collectively in that performative imagination. And um, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think that also uh, contrasts like or add some dim dimensions to the, the panel discussion yesterday where there was already what was put into play was whether or, or what does it mean for these imaginaries to be shared. And here we see that there are already like several dimensions that make them like really hard to, to, to seize as a as a totality and I think well probably what also like influences this is the way like these imaginaries relate to to, to specific uh well parts of the reality or objects and the, here I have a question maybe I'll start with you uh Astrid so so basically like how do the imaginaries that you you study or that the imaginaries that are um operative like in, in your field of study how do they relate to to basically your object of study like for for you it's urban transformation and so like what is the relationship between them right yeah so in preparation for the panel i was thinking about this quite a lot um and i was wondering what this exact connection is because of course um what the imaginaries are made of like the stuff um is difficult to operationalize and also to grasp in empirical work. And as we've just seen, like definitions even differ. Um, so how to make this explicit link from the object of study to this more um, undefinable thing of imaginaries is quite difficult. Uh, for example, I would never really say that we have shifted an imaginary or like that's this kind of claim, it's so hard, it's so hard to make. 
Um, so we usually stick with the criteria for transformations or, or governance change. Um, but yesterday on the Slack, I saw that Abe Hendricks, um, he mentioned uh, Arjun Apadurai, who considers imaginaries as an uh, organized field of social practices. And that sort of made me make this link in my head that uh, I think that that's kind of what we're doing with these um, methodology experiments, with these futures methodologies, um, because I sort of try to gather new social practices and sort of put them together and make new images of possible futures with that. And for example, to illustrate this a little bit, uh, my first field work for my PhD that I did was in Kyoto in Japan. And uh, we worked with a group of food system actors that wanted to change their local food system, make it more local, organic, and more, more fair. And um, together with Joost and also with members of the Feast Project, of whom some are also here, um, we set up this futures process with uh, backcasting, visioning, and gaming. But we used this approach um, using Seeds, which is uh, developed by Elena Bennett and a group of colleagues. And they basically um, call new practices, new sustainable practices that are kind of glimpses into more sustainable futures. They call that seeds. And they th their theory is that by gathering these seed practices, um, you can sort of outline a more sustainable future. So these food system actors that we worked with were actually all involved in individual seeds. And then in our futures game, we also used seeds like other practices, examples from Japan, from Kyoto itself and from all over the world. So we sort of had this really lively process in the end of sort of people who are already engaged in sustainable practices, meeting other people, engaging with new ideas. And then altogether that sort of created this really great new futures that were really motivating for people and um, really activating. So I think for my work, I think this, this reimagining of practices into a new uh, organized field and a new image and ideally a new imaginary, although that's hard to say, I think that uh, kind of covers it. Thanks Astrid and uh, maybe we can move to, to Jérôme's view on this, like how, how do the imaginaries you work with relate, re, relate to your object of study? What do they do? Yeah, I, th I think I've, I have several aspects of this that I want to highlight, but I, I first want to start by uh, concurring with Astrid that I don't think any of us have ever really shifted an imaginary per se, or and, and that it also shouldn't be our particular goal. But reorienting that organization in fields of social practices can be part of the shifting of an imaginary. And th this is also why I think um, it's really important to, to start out from Apadurai's uh, definition there, but also because he goes on by defining imaginaries as also a site of negotiation between individual agency and globally defined um, spaces of possibility. So what, what you do, there, there's always this opportunity to, to reorient and, and restructure parts of those uh, organized fields of social practices. But you're always also in that structuring and in that globally defined field of possibility. And I think that that sort of highlights two, two aspects that I work with. So as uh, Olivier introduced, I've, I've done a lot of work on climate engineering where there's a fundamentally um, opposed research community, really. It's basically split down the middle between people who fundamentally disagree with the whole notion that climate engineering can play any sort of role in uh, our climate policy. And on the other hand, there are people who, try, who are trying to reorient the discussion about climate engineering into an idea that it may have a place in climate policy. And both of these different communities working within that sort of space of climate change are trying to reorient the way that we think about what climate change is and what we can do about climate change. And I think here that, that notion of the, the socio-technical vanguard, or at least some sort of vanguard that, that plays a role in, in reorienting the way that we think about uh, particular issues and that then start to re sort of uh, poke at our 
preconceived notions of what science can do or what technology can do or what the future may be like is I think very important. Um, a second aspect where when I work with it myself is that when, when I came into the Urban Future Studio, a lot of people in the studio were already working with the notion of the techniques of futuring. The specific sort of social practices that we use to bring particular images of the future into being. And once you start thinking about those social practices that make the, the future come into being, um, the imaginary becomes much more fragmented. And it becomes sort of a result of, of all kinds of practices that you can play and tinker with. And I think this, this is the other part where if we think very critically about all of the moments that make up that social imaginary or, or the, the normative notion, then we can start to unpack where and when these imaginaries have critical moments or moments of change. And then we can actually do form and play a part in that negotiation in a much more well-informed way. Thanks, Jan. And uh, Johannes, would you Beautiful. like to, to expand on this? Yeah, yeah for sure. So, um, I'm, uh, I also have my, my tailor open here, uh, so it's always good to, and then, uh, it, it's really interesting to see like what other names are in there I, I also looked at upper derived and uh, i can also really recommend uh strauss on imaginaries her perspective on uh, as an anthropologist on imaginaries is really fascinating because she like challenges the whole field in sociology to like it's not the society who has the imaginaries it's the people <laughs> um and i find that always really helpful um i think i for this question, I always already hinted at it in the in my in the my answer to the first question that for me it's really about in like the practical terms um, it's about trying to make imaginaries a bit more visible, which is hard because like Taylor also refers to imaginaries as part of the background understanding, something that is in the subconscious that only comes forward to like. Um, like stories and legends um, um, and images that is you can never really grasp it, which uh, uh, I'm always very careful to say something is an imaginary because that's kind of not, um, I, mean, I mean, something could be like, an, um, um, like a manifestation of imaginary. But what I found, what, uh, especially here in Germany with all the, like the organizations and companies I work with, um, and um, that there is really almost no understanding of how much our expectations of the future or like, like or, and, and I completely agree, our normative um, expectations of the future or how we expect the future to turn out, how much they influence what we do day to day in our decisions. Um, and this is, uh, uh, and the more I looked into this, uh, th this stuff, the more it became aware to me, like how little we know about this. And this is now mostly, um, or it's like always the beginning of a project is that I first want to make my clients more sensitive to how their own subconscious expectations and, 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 and ideas of the future influence how they behave. Like, like I said before, how they immediately expect to do something with AI or, or, uh, or that, uh, the future of mobility is about autonomous cars or something like that. It's like, like these more like very easy to understand uh, ideas. And, and I've been really, in, in this part, really in, influenced by Stuart Candy and his um, ethno, ethnological um, experiential uh, foresight framework. Because the first thing he does in every project is to map the existing ideas of futures that are already there. And what I found through hard experience is if you don't do that at the beginning, they will come out later on in the actual scenario and foresight work. And people will just throw them in there. But if you ask for them right at the beginning, then they are like, okay, I said it. I said what I think it is. And, and then if you try to loosen them up a bit, you can actually create real like alternative, more broader 
um, um, uh, scenarios or, uh, or future images of the future. Um, so this is just a very, very practical way how we try to apply this uh, by just trying to making it a, a bit, manifest a bit more, make it a bit more tangible um, so then we can start having conversations about it and people can start reflecting. Oh yeah, that's right. I actually, where does it actually come from? Uh, is it like, did I see too many sci-fi movies or uh, do I believe uh, Elon Musk is a demigod um, and, and just do whatever he says or what influences my expectations? It's really fascinating because we don't ask that in our day-to-day -day life. And I try to push people there a bit more. Thanks a lot, Johannes. Yeah, I really like the, the inputs to, the, to this question. Like it really points out to the fact that imaginary is like constructed like through this, all these practices, messy practices. And uh, Jaron, you, you pointed also like to the normative aspect that, that is uh, encompassed in this imaginaries uh, and basically like i think that leads like really to this third question like if there is kind of a normativity inscribed in it like what are what, what is the social function uh of imaginaries like uh, well in the present in our lives like what functions do the imaginaries you encounter have in the present and uh, explain us a little bit more on this yeah i, I was thinking about this a lot and I came up with a very imperfect way to sort of easily explain the way that I think about it. And that, that's that these images of the future that we talk about, they give a reason for doing something. They, they give us within that expectation, and especially when you read the literature on the sociology of expectations, for example, when you think something will happen, if you do a certain thing, that gives you a reason either to do it or not to do it. What the imaginary does to me does more is justify your reason for acting and prescribing implicitly what you deem to be important. So it, it's more about the why than it is about the specific image. And in that why, there are a couple of things that I think are really important. The very first, and that comes to me being just very interested in science is what kind of knowledge about the future do you think you need to make any sort of decision? What kind of knowledge that you use about the future gives you a reliable image to work towards? Um, simultaneously, that ties into the question, who gets to co-create images of the future? And I think this is also implicit in imaginaries, much more than it is in expectations, that in every imaginary there is an idea of who gets to co-create that image of the future. And so there, there is always an inclusionary, but also an exclusionary part to any imaginary. And I think we can't escape that, but we need to be very careful about that. But I think these to me are, are some of the most key functions of what the imaginaries do in the present. So I'll, I'll hand it to whoever's next. I will move to Johannes. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend uh, one book, and that's um, oh you can can speed it, uh, uh, damn filter. It's um, Imagine Futures by Jens Beckert. And then um, Beckert is really fascinating. He's an uh, economic sociologist, and he wrote about basically how future imaginaries are at the heart of capitalism, right? because the, the whole idea of of capitalism is you invest into a hopeful return sometime in the future. Um, and so he wrote, uh, uh, especially in the first few chapters, wrote about even especially the role of future imaginaries um, as a way of society to organize for an uncertain future. Because obviously in, in capitalism, you hate uncertainty because you don't know if you will get your money back. So, um, so this helps, so, so future imaginaries help uh, to organize um, for uncertainty. Uh, and that, that brings one, one other aspect of them. Imaginaries are performative, um, which I find really fascinating. And I can see all of the time. If we all decide, this is the future we're going for. If we all decide, or if uh, like 
a society uh, or like uh, like the uh, the the companies of a country or the EU society, artificial intelligence is the future. Then then it starts to become performative. We all act that way, and then it becomes the future, and that helps us to reduce uncertainty. And I find that really fascinating. If we look at then public discourse, everybody trying to to influence our expectations of the future and what we uh, what we guess from that, uh, or what we uh, how we guess it will turn out, and everybody trying to um, talk, uh, like tell narratives about their preferred future by and by this trying to influence the imaginary uh, of the future. So I think this is a, a role that we constantly see in in our work is this. Uh, performativity aspect of everybody is acting as if this is going to be the future and thus hoping that it actually will be the future because then everybody is set on the same horse and we probably all going to win. Thanks, Johannes. And I move now to, to Astrid. And just maybe a question to Sarah. I think we are coming close to the time, but we started late. Is it okay that we keep some time for questions after that? Yeah, there is a break until five, so it's okay. Yeah. My, yeah, my answer is also really short, I think. I think Kirun and Johannes both made really excellent points. The who co-creates, but also how do imaginaries work in capitalism is both, uh, yeah, really important points. Um, and I also wrote down imaginaries um, are... The, the ways in which people think about how the future should be. So um, that's just a really strong uniting force. So I, I think imaginaries really bring people together. They can form strong bonds and they can come to a consensus about how to proceed in making a future a reality. Um, and I was just still thinking about that Japan case that I mentioned in a previous question where uh, we also did a follow-up study of that future's work. And uh, we really found that the people that we worked with really kept organizing as a group and they kept collaborating and they even established themselves at the local governance level. So it's just, I think imaginaries also have this function of change, even if we can't really manipulate them um, that much, but um, they, they're just like a powerful force in that sense. So that's it. Yeah, thanks Astrid, thanks. The, the three panelists. I, I don't know if one of you still wants to react spontaneously to, to what was just said. And um, well, I, I think I, it was quite interesting. And I mean, for, for me, I don't work primarily with imaginaries. When I think about future in practice, I'm really much more interested in, in promises, for instance, where it's much more thought of. And I was wondering somehow that when listening to you, I mean, to, to me, it seemed like really like maybe imaginaries like provide like a, a grammar for, for all types of uh, futuring practices. I mean, that's like a way I, I would conceive of it and wondering like, how would you react to this thought? Like the imaginaries being a grammar of the future with providing its rules, it's uh, yeah, bounding it somehow, offering a normative, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 I, I think there's there's a strong there's a strong uh, Taylor makes that or like the whole history uh, until Taylor of um, of uh, imagine social imaginaries uh, even before Taylor like Costuriadis uh, talked much more. There is mm -hmm. one social imaginary that organizes a society. Um, yeah, this this is how a society structures itself around an imaginary and. Um, and from uh, uh, also to react to the to the, the last question in, in in the chat, for me the re really the thing about it, especially future imaginaries was I needed a term to point to the thing that cannot really be pointed to. Like there was always something in the room when talking about futures and expectations and images and hopes and dreams for the future there was always something in the room something that was because because it's it's taken for granted uh, as like one of these uh, like attributes of, of imaginaries they are taken for granted and so you don't have to feel to like need to point to them and me, for me 
the whole idea of, of future metrics is to have the term to say, oh, is this, might this be a, a sign of a future imaginary and by this helping us to take something out of the dark, the gray and try to bring it a bit more into the light and see if something is there that um, becomes more tangible. I, I, I would love to jump in on, on that question also of Olivier there um, about a grammar of the future, because I think, I think it's an interesting direction but I would not say it's a grammar of the future. It's a grammar of the present that we project onto the future. And I think this is a fundamental, fundamentally important difference. And I think it also sort of um, relates to the question uh, by Lina in the chat, which I think is a very important question. Um, the question whether or not uh, imaginaries need theories of change. And, and I would answer that question with a wholehearted yes. And I think the problem with 90% at least of imaginary literature as it is being produced right now is that it doesn't have a compelling theory of change. That it's all about there is an imaginary and it does something, it has political effects and it doesn't do anything more. It's just imaginary does this or expect or even like more uh, superficial. We have expectations, we call them imaginaries and they do this. And I think this, so I think Lina's question is spot on. And I think that is something that if we think about imaginaries, that is what we should be thinking about. Just to quickly react to that, that was the interesting part for me of combining social imaginaries with critical future studies, because the whole point about critical future study, the whole idea is to understand existing futures in the present better, like deconstruct them to then reconstruct alternatives. So this, this is why this combination was really fascinating for me to move towards um, a way to say, um, um, how can we take this deconstructive, reconstructive idea of critical future studies and combine it with uh, social imaginaries? A really cool discussion going on here. <laughs> Just wanted to ask, do, do we have other questions uh, in the chat? I saw, yeah, Lina's question. Um, Aaron, I think you, you had a question too. Are you still around? Aaron? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I just, um, I was just recalling, I, I believe one of the presenters, and unfortunately I do not recall which one today, um, brought up a slide or two on deprivileging uh, futures. And that seemed to me uh, that we were kind of bumping up against that when we started talking about, well, who is getting to participate in um, not really the imagining per se, but actually the acknowledgement of what constitutes um, what is then agreed upon as the collectively agreed upon imagination, social imaginary. And, um, and so I was just wondering um, if any of the panel would like to breach what I see as uh, there are probably imaginaries that exist that we are blinded to. They're invisible to us because we we do not understand how the imaginaries are created, who is is bringing them up, and because they're not the dominant kind of image, um, is there any work that you guys are aware of, um, or do you fundamentally disagree with that kind of uh, yeah precept there? Like, what does how? I'm, I'm curious to find out what. Uh, what the panel has to say. Yeah, who wants to go first? Sharon? Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't taking anyone else's space, but um, yeah, I, I think that, I think again, a very good question. And, and I think of course they are there. I think there are two things that, that I wanna specifically uh, respond to that. It's one in the academic field, pretty much the only work that I know of that, that does those imaginaries any justice is from anthropology. Um, so it's Arjun Apadurai and, and many others, but it's mostly his work as sort of uh, uh, things as the thing that people center around. Um, the other thing is how seriously do you take institutional stabilization as a prerequisite for it being an imaginary? Um, because if it's truly invisible, can you say it's institutionally stabilized? 
And I'm not that wedded to it, but if you would go to the SDS sort of field, people would say, well, if it's not embedded in rules, norms, and codes, then it's not really an imaginary. Um, so, and, and again, of course, it can be embedded in rules and codes in, in slums or in other places. Um, so, yeah, that's an obvious question. And I think we should pay much more attention to it. And I think we should therefore take our anthropology more seriously and live more anthropological lifestyles ourselves. Yeah, and just to add to that, like I mentioned before, I would really recommend to read Strauss on uh, on imaginaries, like because he does exactly that point. So her big question is, whose imaginaries are these? Like this is always the question for her. Like who who tells them? Where do they come from? Um, who has influenced them? Um, always focus on the people. Um, I've yeah, I've found that really helpful when when stumbling upon that. Can I have one quick follow up? Um, we've engaged a lot with this idea of uh, critically addressing kind of approaches to futures thinking, um, maybe that are used um, often backcasting and some of those others. And I'm curious, um, again, to hear from the panel, what modes do you think that these processes do or do not um, uh, engage in terms of, of helping to shift or recognize these imaginaries that we might um, be acknowledging just now. Um, and then also, let's say they deserve and need uh, a critical eye, um, but are they already doing things that weren't being done before? Which is to say, are they already um, opening up the idea of the future for many people who may not have uh, had access to that type of thinking, they ne may never have really been encouraged to um, critically or creatively um, address what could the future be and what do they even want the future to be. Yeah, who wants to go on, Astrid? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm still thinking how to formulate this, but I, when Johannes just mentioned that imaginaries are this thing that's sort of fundamentally unknown, like the, the thing you, that's unclear. Um, I think when we designed in Japan the backcasting vision in gaming uh, exercises, we really wanted to go beyond purely um, numerical or positivist approaches. Um, because that's at least one way to engage with the imaginary. I think if you like tradi more traditional scientific methods or, or pr predictive methods maybe don't go there at all. So we found that this combination of methods at least made a step in that direction, especially when you add um, a creative exercise like gaming. Um, and I think the previous session was really wonderful as well and sort of illustrated that power in a way as well um, so it's it's sort of an experimental process but we're, i feel like by combining these methods and experimenting you can at least approach um this but of course we have to remain critical and like the points that were made previously and like who then participates and who designs these methods um is really important and should always be kept in mind So I was looking if there were other questions in the chat. Seems not. Does anyone else have a question to the panelists? Hi, yeah, I could. Uh, oh, yeah, I can ask a question. I can start my video also, but uh, sitting here with my baby so <laughs> no i just wanted to ask thanks all for a very 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 interesting uh, discussion it was great to follow uh, she was also uh, very quiet um just wanted to ask we have the um, yesterday's panel discussed intentionality and i think it very much relates to some of the last points that were made so not just about you know, the very intended um, imaginaries of the future and they have performative effects, but also the unintended imaginaries. And that made me think about um, 
I think in my research, and I think much of the research that other people have been involved in, um, we tend to focus on the on the intended imaginaries and how how they are institutionalized or not. Sorry, I'll keep it short. Um, but I just wanted to say, think keeping this in mind, the unintended. You know, is there is there something maybe in in other people's um, in your work that you have somehow came across? So much more of the unintended imaginaries and how they become maybe uh, institutionalized, normalized, etc. Okay, I'll lower my mic. But yeah, if anybody is interested in commenting on that, I would be very interested in hearing it. I think Johannes, you might have some points here or some uh, points to say. I find it weird. Really, really, but uh, I remember yeah, yeah, you addressed this I'm, explicitly I'm, uh, in the video. So. I'm just, I find it interesting the question are there unintended imaginaries or unattended by whom, for whom? So, um, or is there always because of like the performative effect or this interest of, is it possible that something as large as an imaginary in a group society a collective could, could establish or could come about without some intention behind that? Um, this is what I'm wondering. I, I don't know. Um, if, <laughs> would that mean like imaginary by accident um and i'm not sure that's that's possible um but isn't it yeah i find it question really interesting i have to think about it yeah yeah i'd, I'd love to jump in there because i i, I would agree I, I think maybe the um difference between intended and unintended imaginary it's difficult. It's maybe also to me not so fruitful, but I think if you rephrase it into the implicit and the explicit imaginary, it becomes much more interesting. And I think there are tons and tons of things that are implicit. And I think this is this is specifically part of the imaginary and what is more than the image is that it's implicit. And that there is also, of course, a lack of explicit intentionality there in from time to time um but just intentionality i think doesn't cover it there Astrid, do you want to to add something here no yeah i agree um but i was just thinking also about negative imaginaries if that's something to because we've i feel like we've approached it as a quite optimistic concept and something that's really like everybody has these these thoughts and these normative um aspects that they shapes their life shape their lives with and like um but i feel like what if there's like a really negative imaginary maybe this is like going a bit away from the intentional imaginaries point but just to make it more complex i thought i was thinking this morning about negative imaginaries and like if that can be some sort of destructive force even so just yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Well, thanks a lot while we are entering new terrain here. It's, I think it's quite uh, stimulating, inspiring. Mm, but still, I think I will close the discussion here because I think we're nearing uh, to the end of the session. It was supposed to be a break. And I think it was <laughs> we're quite raining again. <laughs> thanks a lot for, for your participation to the panelists and also to all the participants who asked questions. And um, I think we close it here. There are some questions. Sarah, I think you will post them then in the Slack or so. And maybe we can continue the discussion there or somewhere else. And thanks again all for participating. And thanks you too, uh, Olivier, for moderating and preparing the panel discussion, for choosing the questions and uh, the whole structure. Uh, really amazing work. And uh, thanks, everyone, for um, sharing your thoughts and your knowledge uh, with us.